Hey, today what we're going to do is something new is we're getting ready to kick off a brand new season of First Wednesday Prayer Nights. What I decided, I want to make this something really special for you. I want to make it something really special for our church. And so we're going to start a series here at First Wednesday Prayer Night that you're only going to get at First Wednesday Prayer Night. We're not going to do it on Sunday morning, but it's an important series, I believe, for the health of our church. And the series is going to be called Seven Habits of a Healthy Church. If you're here during our We Are Redemption series, you know that I actually covered this as a part of the sermon, What is a Church? where we looked at the seven habits of the first church and talked about a couple of ways that we could begin to apply these to the life of our church here at Redemption. And because I have so much jam-packed in a sermon on a Sunday, I barely have enough time. I only gave me 65 minutes. I barely have enough time to preach it. I decided, hey, what a better way for us to be able to dive into God's word, motivate and encourage one another than to take those seven habits and then for the next seven months on the first Wednesday prayer night, begin to discuss and pray through and apply these habits to our life. And here's why I'm pretty excited about this, because there's seven habits and in seven months, here's where we're going to be. It's going to be our five-year anniversary as a church. That's right. In March, we're going to hit our five-year anniversary as a church. And I don't know about you, but I believe that the best days of redemption are in front of us. I believe that the best is yet to come. I believe that our future is better than our past. I believe that God is still moving, still working, and God still has things for us to do. And so what I want us to do is for us as a core team, that's you guys, for the core of the church, for the people who are devoted and encouraged and you're passionate about prayer, I want to be able to help us get healthy because healthy things grow. And so as we get healthy, I believe that we're going to grow. So we're going to discuss seven habits of a healthy church. And if you have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen. But if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And as you're going to walk through this, you're going to see the seven different habits. And I'll kind of go ahead and give those to you up front. The first habit that we're going to talk about tonight is devoted to discipleship. A healthy church is devoted to discipleship. We're going to talk about that tonight. Number two is off-field worship. Number three, committed to community. Number four, giving generously. Number five, prioritizing prayer. That's what we're doing tonight. We are prioritizing prayer. Number six, effective in evangelism. And number seven, a church that is healthy is a church that takes ownership. See, this church, your church, can only be as healthy as you are. One of the favorite metaphors that the Bible uses when referring to a church is that we are a body. And if you think about health, will you really kind of make a connection to your body? And here's generally what I believe, that if you take care of your body, your body will take care of you. That if you eat right, you diet, you're exercising, and if you're taking care of your body and you're doing the things that your body needs, then your body is going to begin to take care of you as well. And it's the same thing in the church, that if you, as a member of the body, take care of yourself, well, then the body of Christ is going to take care of you. And we all get healthy, well, the body of Christ actually gets healthier as well. And so here's what Acts 2.42 tells us. It says, and they devoted themselves. That's the big word we're going to talk about today. Devoted. Circle it, underline it, highlight it, mark up your Bible. Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking bread of prayers. That's devoted to discipleship. And all came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. That's worship. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common, committed to community. They were selling their possessions and belongings, and they were distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That is giving generously. And I just want to pause here and encourage you as a church. Last Sunday, we took up a special offering. How many of you here last Sunday for the one big Sunday? We took up a special offering for Hurricane Laura and Convoy of Hope in Lake Charles. And I just want to say, healthy churches give generously and listen, redemption. Guess what? You guys gave over $7,742. One offering. 
Praise the Lord for you. A healthy church gives generously. Number five, they prioritize prayer. And day by day, they were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, just a little bit about me. Okay, One of my favorite things to do is to have a certain routine and rhythm for my life. Right, I know some of you, you're more fly by the seat of your pants and just make it up as you go along. I get that. But I actually, I, I function better when I have a routine for my life. And so one of the parts of my routine is that I wake up early and I drink some coffee and I, before all the kids are up and I go out for a run. And I, I love running. I go running every single morning and I run about five miles in the, mor in the morning. I do that every single morning because that's good for me. It's not just good for me physically, which it is in a sense, but it's more than that. It's actually, it's good for my mental health as well because I'm able to clear my mind, take deep breaths, relieve stress. But even more than that, what I've discovered is the older I get is that running for me is not just about my physical health. It is not even about my mental health, but it really has a greater impact on my spiritual health. That as I'm running, I'm able to begin to clear my mind and invite God to be able to speak to me, invite the Holy Spirit to be able to fill me up as I begin running and I'm taking care of myself. What I realize is I'm depending more on God. I'm more grateful and appreciative for what God has done. So I've developed that as a habit in my life. Now, the truth is that's only a recent habit for my life. See, before that, I used to get up and I would try to go to the gym and I didn't make it all the time. And as I would be at the gym, I'd be lifting weights and I would just get tired and I would lift like one or two and be like, that's eh, good enough, I'm done, right? And then I would kind of walk away, right? And so I had a real big struggle doing that. And then COVID-19 happened. And as COVID-19 happened, the gym closed. And when the gym closed, well, then all of a sudden, I, I just kind of stopped going to the gym because I didn't have the discipline to be able to encourage her to force her to motivate myself to begin to go and work out and lift weights and have the kettlebells and do all the Pilates and cardio that I probably could have done at the house. I didn't have the motivation to be able to do that. So I just kind of started running. Now, my question for us is whenever the church closed during COVID-19, how many people actually felt kind of like I did whenever it came to working out? You're like, well, there goes my motivation, the external motivation. There goes the opportunity for me to be able to be healthy. And I have the motivation. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be the church. And you might have done it for a week. You might have done it for two weeks. You maybe did it for a month. But after that, what happened? Well, all of a sudden, well, other habits begin to form. And so instead of reading your Bible, it was replaced with watching the news. Instead of praying, it was replaced with your iPhone, scrolling through Instagram, Facebook. Instead of the healthy habits that you had been working on and developing, it was replaced by unhealthy habits in your life as well. Because I know that those same things happened in my life and I'm not special, so I bet you were experiencing some of the same things too. And the way that I was over, able to overcome the unhealthy habits was by replacing it with better habits. All right, you don't just remove bad habits. You have to replace bad habits as well. And the same idea that we're going to see as we begin walking through these things is that we don't just remove bad habits. You have to replace them with better habits. And as we're going to be walking through some of these, what we're going to see is that there are some bad habits in our church. There are some bad habits in our life when it comes to our spiritual health. And we all know those bad habits. We all know what areas in our life we're not living up to the standard of God. We all know the areas of our life that we're not achieving God's purposes and plans for us. We all know those areas of our life where we just wish we had a little bit more discipline. Amen? Amen. You know it. I don't have to preach a sermon about it because you know you better than you do, right? And then anybody else, you know the bad habits. And so here's what we want to do of this series is we're actually going to be not just removing some of those habits in our life and in our church. Instead, we're going to be replacing those habits with better habits. And so the first habit that we're going to look at today is the habit of discipleship. We want to be devoted to our discipleship. Here's, here's what it says. It says, and they were devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the fellowship and to the breaking bread of, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Your habits determine your health. 
Your habits determine your health. And the first habit that we're gonna see is that they are devoted to discipleship. And so there's three things that I wanna walk us through today. In that one little verse, three things. The first thing is, if you wanna be devoted to discipleship, you have to be devoted to God's purpose, That is the apostles' teaching devoted to God's people. That is the fellowship and the breaking of bread. And then the last one is devoted to God's presence. Here's habit number one. We want to be devoted to God's purpose for our life. We want to be devoted to God's people. That's you and me, the church. And we'll be devoted to God's presence. I love that Acts 2 says this word. They devoted themselves. What is devoted? Devoted is ongoing, continual. It is habitual. It is a devotion that they have. They don't just do it when they feel like it. They do it even when they don't feel like it because they know that they need it. That's how habits work, that you don't feel as if you are being true to yourself when you're not accomplishing this thing. That's the way that a habit works, right? You know, for those of you, you know, for those of you who exercise, you know that when you're, when you miss a day, it just doesn't feel right. You know, when you brush your teeth in the morning, right? And then you don't brush your teeth in the morning. How many of you know? You just don't feel right. We all know that you ain't right either because we can smell it. Brush your teeth, right? When you forget to put your deodorant on, please do that. Make that a habit. That is a good habit. We want to remove bad habits, replace it with good habits. Put your deodorant on, right? You know that something's off whenever you don't live according to that habit. And that's the same way that they were. We should be the same way, that when we're not following Jesus and we're not devoted to our discipleship, we must understand that there's something off in our lives. They continually devoted themselves, not when they feel like it, but even when they don't feel like it, because that's when they knew that they needed the most. How many of you would attest to that? How many of you would testify that when you don't feel like going to a small group, that's when God shows up the most? How many of you would testify whenever you don't feel like serving on a Sunday, that's when a guest shakes your hand and tells you that you are the first person to say hi to them all week. Or when someone gives their life to Jesus, when you're sharing your faith with another person, you're like, they're probably not going to come to church. And you hand them an invite card anyway. And then you see them in the lobby. You're like, wow, God showed up even when I don't feel like it because that's when I need it the most. They devoted themselves. And here's what they devoted themselves to. They made a conscious decision to devote themselves first to God's purpose for their life. Here's what they say, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, this was their understanding of what the word of God was. Let me just undertell, tell you, if you want to know what your purpose in life is, you just got to read God's word. Because this word is true. This word is trustworthy. This word tells us exactly who God is, where God's at, what God's doing, and how we can live our life for God. The whole goal of the Bible is to reveal to us who Jesus is. From the table of contents in the front to the maps in the back, every story ultimately is only, totally, solely about Jesus. And as we read God's word, we're going to discover God's purpose for our life. They devoted themselves to the word of God and they discovered their purpose in the midst of it. What I want to encourage you with is I want you to read your Bible. I want you to devote yourself to reading God's word 365 days a year. In in, in America, the average home has two Bibles and most people don't know where they're at. You can find it on your phone, pull out your phone. There's no excuse for us to not be reading our Bibles. Did you know that people gave their lives so you could have a Bible in your hand? They didn't have Bibles back then. They had old scrolls and you have to go to a temple or synagogue and there was an oral culture. So somebody would memorize the Torah or somebody would memorize the scriptures that you would get together and then they would read it to you from memory and you would have to sit there and listen to it. We don't live in that day and age anymore. Everybody has access to a Bible. There's no reason or excuse for us to not be reading our Bibles. People gave their lives to write down, to copy, to be able to give the Bible for us. And now we have them in all translations. We have study Bibles, journal Bibles, illuminated Bibles. I don't know what that is. Is there a light bulb in it? What is the illuminated Bible? I don't know. There's even a Bible that you can take in the bathtub with you. You can read the Bible in the bath, okay? That's just the world we live in. So there's no reason for us to not devote ourselves to the scriptures. And here's here's what it says. You'll discover your purpose 
as you begin to understand God's word for your life. And so let me just read to you this. This comes from a research study, and here's, here's what it says, because I know that it's not enough for you just to listen to me, encourage you to read your Bible. So let's let some statistics encourage you. Nearly 90% of frequent Bible readers say that they have peace most of the time, compared to 58 people, 58% who do not read their Bibles. How many of you could go for a little bit of peace in your life? Okay, that comes from reading and devoting yourself to the word of God. And it goes on and says that 58% of people uh, who read their Bible less. The study also revealed that 92% of frequent Bible readers know a clear purpose, that's a word, purpose, compared to 69% of infrequent Bible readers who do not discover the purpose for life. 81% of frequent readers say that they feel content most of the time compared to 67 of infrequent leaders, and 64% of frequent readers say that they feel joy most of the time versus, get this, 35% of people who do not read their Bible on a daily basis. Okay, look, look at the number, right? It says here, 64% of people who read their Bible experience joy in their life versus... 35% of people who infrequently read their Bible. If there's not a better reason for you to read your Bible, I don't know what is. How many of you want to find peace in your life? How many of you want to find joy in your life? How many of you want to have contentment with your current situation and discover your purpose? Well, it comes from devoting yourself to God's word and discovering God's purpose for your life. They devoted themselves to God's purpose. The second thing they did is this. They devoted themselves to God's people, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. They eat. If you read through 42 through 47, it actually says they ate twice, right? In five verses, they've already eaten two meals. That's my kind of church, amen? I love that church, right? One of the things that Bo always makes fun of me is that we eat more than the Baptists do, that we're always just eating. Come to Next Steps, we're going to feed you. Come to my house, we're going to feed you. Have a deacon dinner, we're going to feed you. Have a party, we're going to feed you every time. We, we have donuts in the lobby, we're going to feed you every time. Why? Because that's biblical. But here's what it does, is it's a devotion to God's people. It says they devoted themselves to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread together. Be devoted to God's people. Listen, there is no such thing as DIY discipleship. It just doesn't happen. We live in a day and age where everybody wants to be lone rangers and do their own thing and be their own person. And everybody's an individual, but that's not the way that a family works. That's not the way that a body works. That's not the way that the church is supposed to work. There's no such thing as DIY discipleship. You have to be devoted to God's people. Because God's people, they encourage you. They motivate you. Here's what happens when we're all gathered together and worshiping. It encourages me to raise my hands a little bit higher, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Whenever I hear you singing, it gives me the confidence to sing a little bit louder because I'm not very good. I need you to drown me out. I sing a little bit louder. Some of you wish that I wouldn't, but I'm encouraged by you. So I sing a little bit louder. I serve a little bit deeper. I pray a little bit harder. I continue to devote myself because your faith builds my faith and we encourage one another. You got to be devoted to God's people. There's no such thing as DIY discipleship. So let me give you just a couple of reasons why you need to be devoted to God's people in the church. The first thing is this. A church family identifies you as a genuine believer, that you're encouraged by surrounding yourself with other people, and you commit yourself in a local church through baptism, through prayer, through taking communion together, through worshiping. It identifies you as a genuine believer. Number two, it moves you from self-centered isolation. COVID-19, what most people began to experience was an isolation, right? Solitude is a good thing as a spiritual discipline. Isolation gets you alone where the enemy can beat you up and then take away your joy and rob you of your purpose in life. But whenever you're surrounded by other people, it pulls you out of isolation and it brings you into community together. The second thing we see, third thing is it fosters spiritual growth. That whenever we're surrounded together, then you're blessing me and I continue to grow. That you're encouraging me and I continue to grow. You're motivating me and I continue to grow. And I grow when I'm around other people. There's an old proverb that says this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's how the church is designed to work for spiritual growth. The book of Proverbs says iron sharpens iron. It produces spiritual growth. Also, we share in a mission together. These disciples, they're going to go on and they're going to change the world forever. There's 12 men. 
and they're praying and they're believing that God's gonna do something great. The Holy Spirit falls in Acts chapter two. 3,000 people get saved in a single day and a movement is launched. They gather together and they're breaking bread and the fellowship together and they're continuing the mission of God. They could not do that on their own. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Go to all nations, make disciples, baptize in them. Could you imagine if Bartholomew tried to do that by himself? He's like, that's just too much work for one person. The mission of God is too much work for one person. You're not going to do it on your own. You need other people in your life. In fact, Jesus sends out his disciples two by two because he believes in community so much together that he wouldn't even send out his own disciples without having a partner to go do ministry with. The next thing we see is that it protects you from backsliding. Do you have to go to church and be a Christian? No, you don't have to. My question is, well, why wouldn't you want to? Because, I mean, you don't have to have a parachute to jump out of an airplane. I just don't think it's smart. Do you have to go to church to be a Christian? No, but it's just not smart for you not to be a part of one. A Christian without a church is like a sailor without a ship. A Christian without a church is like, is like a parent without a child. A Christian without a church is like pizza without ranch dressing. I mean, can you have it? Yes, but why would you want to? It just goes better together. You need to have a church family because it prevents you from backsliding. It prevents you from giving up. It prevents you from quitting. It prevents you from temptations that overcome and take you over. It prevents you from secrets. It prevents you from lying to yourself and others. It prevents you from wearing a mask. It prevents you from living a life of guilt and shame. It prevents you from falling away from your faith. That's what a church family does. There's no such thing as DIY discipleship. We have to be devoted to God's people. And the last thing is this. We have to be devoted to God's presence. Not only were they devoted to God's purpose for their life and God's people that surrounded them, but they depended on God's presence through prayer. And this is the whole reason that we're gathering here for First Wednesday Prayer Nights is because we want to be a people that is devoted to God's presence. And confession time, redemption, over the history of our church, we have not been a good church when it comes to praying. We just, we've been really devoted to preaching. Yeah, God's word. We're devoted to preaching, discovering God's purpose for our life. Life changed through Jesus. Every man, woman, and child, I'll preach through every single book of the Bible before the day that I die. I will preach my own sermon, close the casket. Y'all could throw some dirt on me and Ethan will preach. That's the way that we built our church. Lots of devoted to the apostles teaching and discovering our purpose. Lots of Gathered together as God's people. Lots of eating, lots of breaking of bread, but prayer has not been a priority for our church. And that's the reason why we started doing First Wednesday prayers. For me, I always had small prayers as a pastor. I would love to be able to tell you that I'm some big prayer warrior who had these bold prayers and that I was gonna shake the heavens and bring kingdom of God here on earth and that Beaumont better watch out because this church is gonna, woo! I, I would love to tell you I prayed those kind of prayers, but I didn't. I prayed small, cowardly prayers because I was too afraid of expecting too much for God. Like as if God was gonna be bothered by my prayers. And might I submit to you this, that God's not bothered by big prayers. God's bothered by prayers that don't honor him. Amen. And when you're not praying bold prayers, if you're not praying big prayers, if you're not praying prayers that scare you, then maybe your prayers aren't big enough. My prayers were just, God, I wish that we had a church of 100 people and we had a nice little building and maybe I could earn a paycheck so that my wife won't be too upset. <laughs> And God answered all those prayers by the third year of our church. So what does that mean? Our church is finished? Our church is done? There's no more reason for redemption? It only took God three years to answer every prayer that I prayed. It's time for us to start praying again. It's time for us to start believing again. It's time for us to start praying and believing and expecting that God's going to do something great in our church. This is why we're going to start this series, because I want you to pray and to pray and to believe that God is going to do something big in our church, because I believe this. A church is only limited by the size of its prayers. 
Do you want to see the lost saved? Then pray to the Lord of the harvest. Do you want to see lives changed? Then pray to the one who changes lives. Do you want to see breakthrough happen? Then pray to the God of breakthrough. Do you want to see healings take place? Pray to the one who heals. Do you want to see the gifts of the spirit be manifested in your life? Then pray to the giver of the gifts. Do you want to see a gospel-centered movement in the heart of the city where every man, woman, and child experiences life change through Jesus? Is that the kind of church that you want to be a part of? then pray to the one who is the head of the church and to the one who says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm praying big, bold prayers now. I'm praying prayers. I'm praying for your, for your brother and for your sister. I'm praying for your family. I'm praying for your daughters. I'm praying for that guy at work. I'm praying for you that you would lead one person to Jesus over the course of this year. I am praying that there is a 155,000 square foot building right across the street that God is going to give to us and we're gonna raise funds and we're gonna do our part. We're gonna play our role, but I'm praying that God would answer the prayers and that the church would continue to thrive and grow and flourish and that we would become healthy. And that we would be healthy by replacing old habits, old habits such as fear, old habits such as complacement, old habits such as apathy, old habits such as it's just another day, I'm just going to show up and serve and then I'm going to go home. Old habits, old habits are replaced by new habits devoted to discipleship.